Hello everyone. In today's session, we will discuss Graham Greene's autobiographical essay, The Lost Childhood. Graham Greene, through his essay, tries to portray the painful experiences of his childhood as a result of parental neglect. This led to despair, grief and boredom which haunted the author for years to come. Also, the effect of these ills can be found enmeshed within the fabric of his work. Graham Greene was born on 2nd October 1904 and died on 3rd April 1991. He was the fourth among six children of his family. They were all brought up in a comfortable bourgeois intellectual background. The family represented all that was most able in the English professional class. There was no loneliness to be experienced in his parents' old spacious house crowded with people. Six children, a nanny, a nursemaid, a gardener, a fat and cheerful cook, a beloved head housemaid and a squad of assistant maids. His father, who was the headmaster of Berkhamsted School, was always shut up in his study, working on the timetable or reading. He was seldom accessible to his children. Green felt very little affection for him and as a young man deliberately set out to hurt the sentiment of his father whose idea was stopping liberal in politics and gently conservative in morals. Green was separated from his mother by the presence of servants. His mother was rational, kind, cold and practical. The real centre of the boy's emotional life was his nanny, an old woman who was pensioned off. Thus, he became more remote than ever from his father and mother. Her devotion and service earn a brief paragraph in Green's autobiography. I remember her bent over my bath with her white hair in a bun, holding a sponge. Her temper deteriorated before she retired on a pension, but I never remember being afraid of her, only impressed by the white bun of age. Thus, the sense of abandonment by parents, which is a part of the lost childhood of so many of his fictional characters, has stemmed from his own experiences. The feeling of loneliness is a very remarkable theme which Green has presented in The Man Within, England Made Me, Brighton Rock and The Potting Shed and Carving a Statue. In stories like The Basement Room and Under the Garden as well, similar themes can be found. Graham Greene's account of his childhood and adolescence give the feeling that the recurrence of CD backgrounds, obsessed characters and extreme situations in Greene's novels is evidence of obsession filled motives in a single pattern established in his early years. The past of a writer is of great value to him in novel writing. Francois Mouret has said, even if he withdraws from the world and shuts his eyes and stops his ears, his most distant past will begin to ferment. His childhood and youth alone is enough to provide a born novelist with an immense amount of literary nourishment. Nobody can stop the flow of the river which flows from him. Green's novels and entertainments established the truth of this statement. It is because so much of the experiences communicated in his novels 
flows from Green's memories that it is possible to view comprehensively in his work both the man who suffers and the mind which creates. Green's unhappy childhood has had a seminal influence on all his fiction. We don't know all about those unhappy years, but from what we know of the events and influences of Green's early life, it is possible to gather evidence of flight, rebellion and misery during those first 16 years when the novelist is formed. The main source of information are a book of essays titled The Lost Childhood, A Sort of Life, Journey Without Maps and The Lawless Roads. Writing about H. H. Munro in The Lost Childhood, Green says, There are certain writers as different as Dickens is from Kipling who never shakes off the burden of childhood. All later experience seems to have been related to those months or years of unhappiness. Life which turns its cruel side to most of us at an age when we have begun to learn the arts of self-protection took these two writers by surprise during the defenselessness of early childhood. Green himself is one such writer. He was born a little too close to the pain threshold to use the expression coined by William James. Born in 1904, the son of Charles Henry Green, headmaster of Berkhamsted and Graham Green attended his father's school. A sensitive boy, he felt cramped in his environment and was thrown upon the resources of his own imagination to fight the boredom and despair which beset his life. In the personal postscript to his book of essays, Green writes, I was 17 and terribly bored and in love with my sister's governess, one of those miserable, hopeless, romantic loves of adolescence that set in many minds the idea that love and despair are inextricable and that such successful love hardly deserves the name. At that age, one may fall irrevocably in love with failure and success of any kind loses half its savour before it is experienced. And he goes on to say, I think the boredom was far deeper than the love. It had always been a feature of childhood. It would set in on the second day of the school holidays. The first day was all happiness and after the horrible confinement and publicity of school seemed to consist of light, space and silence. But a prison conditions its inhabitants. I never wanted to return to it, yet I was so conditioned that freedom bored me unutterably. His rebellion ended after a few hours when he was ambushed by his elder sister on the common. He was thereupon sent to a psychoanalyst. The psychoanalysis gave him a correct orientation but wrung him dry. Green says, For years, it seems to me, I could take no aesthetic interest in any visual thing at all. Staring at a sight that others assured me was beautiful, I would feel nothing. I was fixed in my boredom. Green's description of his state of mind in his teens brings to mind the mescaline experience which according to Colin Wilson, plunges the taker into a kind of dream world, a world of inaction where one has no defense against one's latent fears and fantasies. Wilson writes about a young novelist who took mescaline. She describes herself as inclined to catatonia, 
a state of mental automatism in which the will ceases to function and the limbs remain fixed in any position in which they are placed. Green's state of mind was also akin to the worn and heartless mood, which Coleridge describes in Dejection and Ode. Green's boredom, like Coleridge's, was in truth a feeling of despair. Boredom, despair were and continued to be one of the strong emotions which lie behind Green's way of seeing the world and nature of man. Green describes his persistent and desperate attempts to escape from this emptiness and lifeless depression. He indulged in such neurotic acts as drinking hypo or hay fever lotion, eating a bunch of deadly nightshade or taking 20 aspirins before swimming. He was without any sense of strangeness when he came to the Russian Roulet Act. He had read about the white Russian officers who used to invent hazards to escape boredom. One man would slip a charge into a revolver and turn the chambers at random and his companion would put the revolver to his head and pull the trigger. The chance, of course, was 6 to 1 in favour of life. At the age of 17, to discover the possibility of enjoying again the visible world by risking its total loss. Green began his experiment with Russian roulette using his brother's revolver. He would put the muzzle of the revolver in his right ear and pull the trigger, not knowing whether he would shoot himself or not. The experiment was repeated several times until its novelty wore off. Eventually, it ceased to excite him at all and became as mundane as taking an aspirin tablet. After the sixth and last attempt, he gave up this particular campaign against boredom, but the war against it had to go on. Writing about Green as a schoolboy, Quennell says, Graham Green was not, in those days, the careworn and hagridden personage whom one might possibly conjure up from a study of his recollections. Tall, lank and limp, with an extremely pallid skin, but stop, cheerfully observant eyes, he would have made an admirable Piero in the 18th century Commedia dell'Arte. Concealing, under his rather woebegone mask, his great capacity for cynical humour. He was often exuberant, he could be positively blithe nor have the exuberance and blitheness vanished. And even at the present period, when I reread his books, those sombre chronicles of sin and suffering, where every form of pleasure is naturally suspect, every love affair inescapably doomed, and a breath of evil mixes with the fog that swirls those lonely street lamps, I sometimes feel that I am confronting the spirited schoolboy in a more accomplished and more arrogant guise. I cannot resist the suspicion that he gets a good deal of fun, light-hearted schoolboy fun from causing his own and his reader's flesh to creep and that he half enjoys the sensations of disgust and horror that he arouses with such unusual terror. It is, however, the careworn and hagridden personage who has been predominant in the novels, while the admirable Piero makes himself felt in the later entertainments. Reading Green's recollections, 
one is often reminded of the irreparable damage wrought on a man in his childhood when the flaw enters the flaw which decides in what fashion the rock will split later for green childhood is not a period of wordsworthian innocence of the visionary gleam and the trailing clouds of glory it is in childhood that innocence is betrayed and the seeds of future corruption sown the child lives in an evil world the world of moral chaos lies brutality complete in humanity the fate of so many of green's protagonists is directly traceable to the traumatic experiences of their childhood carolyn d scott remarks that no critic can escape the childhood theme in green for it is the one obsession out of which his tragedies grow at the end of his essays the lost childhood green quotes the lines from a is poem germinal in the lost boyhood of judas christ was betrayed green's own boyhood we believe provides the clue to his personality and outlook his views about reality formulated from experience and observation have matured but in their essence remain unchanged he might say with ida arnold in brighton rock look at me i've never changed it's like those sticks of rock bite it all the way down you'll still read brighton that's human nature another fascinating account is how the ideas of heaven and hell were unalterably fixed in the young boy's mind they have colored the deepest level of green's personality and fiction lawrence learner remarks he depicts the world as hell since that is the first argument to faith if there is hell must there not be a heaven like their creator the first thing that the characters in green's fictions come to know intimately is the hell of pain solitude and squalor this knowledge becomes the basis of belief a sort of intuition of heaven they immerse themselves in the unfathomable horror of life before they approach the bliss of the eternal city in green's own life the primary symbols were altered later and he was gradually led to his conversion to roman catholicism the mother of god took the place of the brass eagle one began to have a dim conception of the appalling mysteries of love moving through a ravaged world the curse dars admitting to his mind all the impurity of a province peggy challenging god in the cause of the damned it remained something when associated with misery violence evil green goes on to quote rilke about the torments and agonies with which the mystery of divine love is associated although green has declared that his conversion to roman catholicism was prompted by intellectual not emotional belief one cannot help feeling that the emotional revulsion caused by the experience of evil had much to do with it vexed by the problem of evil and suffering green found the hint of an explanation in the roman catholic church it may however be stated that green's sense of evil cannot be attributed to his adopted religion his sense of evil already obsessive was caught up in his conversion and as janet adam smith has pointed out 
in so far as it is now religious it does not strike one as specifically roman catholic it is certainly religious because it is based on the recognition of supernatural forces which are responsible for the horror as well as for the glory of man's life in the lost childhood green speaks of the profound influence which books have on a man's life during childhood in his case as well books helped to determine the pattern of his writings he says but in childhood all books of divination telling us about the future and like the fortune teller who sees a long journey in the cards or death by water they influence the future much of the pervasive irony in green's novels springs from the author's conviction that failure is inevitable a sense of doom hovers about his characters and they live and die conscious of their failure green's world like marjorie bowen's is a subversive world he does not of course create perfectly evil characters but the pattern which his novels exemplify is the same as that of the viper of milan perfect evil walking the world where perfect good can never walk again and only the pendulum ensures that after all in the end justice is done this pattern was already there though religion might explain it later in other terms it is because green's awareness of failure cruelty and ugliness antedates his conversion that there is no hesitation in accepting him as a novelist who is a catholic instead of as a catholic novelist in the lost childhood green writes in an essay on henry james the novelist depends preponderantly on his personal experience the philosopher depends on correlating the experience of others therefore the novelist philosophy will always be a little lopsided green's own ideas according to kenneth allert and milliam farris have been conceived personally and proved on his pulses the nature of green's sensibility through a consideration of the emotions and experiences of his early life can be witnessed in the lost childhood one comes across bits of self revelation in his critical comments on various writers green too is a victim a man obsessed with evil as a thing in itself as something both inside us and outside us his characters in both their human and non-human contexts are meant to illustrate its workings his deeply personal vision is of a gloomy squalid world dominated by pain and ugliness violence and treachery inhabited by isolated hunted and guilt ridden men and women who are driven to crime and sin and eventually to despair and death achieving sometimes by an act of love or charity and by the mercy of god the regeneration of the spirit of salvation this vision is realized with consistency in a series of novels beginning with the man within we may conclude with green's own remark which tells us as much about him as about dickens the creative writer perceives his world once and for all in childhood and adolescence and his whole career is an effort to illustrate his private world in terms of the great public world which we share
In ancient shadows and twilights, where childhood had strayed, the world's greatest sorrows were born and its heroes were made. In the lost childhood of Judas, Christ was betrayed. Graham Greene has created a landscape wherein the child has been projected as a prominent feature. This has been done to such an extent that we are immediately aware of him, chiefly when the child is absent. There he is, his eyes glued to the keyhole, his ear open to the crack of the door and the creak of the bed, peering, listening and observing in his unadulterated innocence, our lack of innocence. He is infected and implicated in violence and sexuality. Despite this, on growing up, the child projects an uncanny perception of the world. His perception of the adult is the beginning of his initiation into full-blown, self-conscious evil, the start of moral life in its various manifestations. An initiation is a fall through knowledge to maturity. Behind it, there persists the myth of the Garden of Eden. The aspiration to know good and evil is to be deprived of the joy of innocence and to take on the burden of sin and death. Yet, the child is not a participant in the fall, but a witness, only vicariously inducted into the knowledge of sin. In this modified version of the fall of man, there are four participants in the fall, not three. They are the man, the woman, the serpent and the child, the last presumably watching everything from behind the tree. In his essay, The Lost Childhood, Green maintains that the impressions of childhood determine, to a very great extent, the reactions of old age. In his fiction, especially in the first decade, his novels are replete with reference to childhood events which have a formation, a relationship with the adult personality. A single incident of childhood often leaves a permanent mark on the personality and often changes the very mental makeup of an individual human being. With this, we come to the conclusion of this session. Hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you.